Hello everyone, welcome back to the second part of our symposium, Adventurous Curators International Perspectives. Um, just to remind us all who are our illustrious panel here, we've got Jonathan Watkins, Director of Icon Gallery from Birmingham, who's our chair. We have Anne Elgood, the Senior Curator from Hammer Museum in Los Angeles. We have Rosie Cooper, the Head of Exhibitions from Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill on Sea. We have Daniel Bauman, Director of the Kunsthalle Zurich. And we have Gary Carrion Muirari, the, the Krauss family curator of the New Museum in New York. Over to you, Jonathan. Now, this morning we had um, four presentations and, um, and a ver various ideas and issues, observations sort of cropped up. There was this uh, touching on the question of the local, which is, I think, particularly pertinent, sort of given, given the, the local context for this, this conversation. But, but there was... Um, and you're all very good at representing the institutions that, um, that you're working for. But there is this, this uh, whole business of being an adventurous curator that I thought we would bring the conversation back to. After all, it is the title of, um, of today's symposium. And I'd, I'd like more personal answers to the question. And, and perhaps if each of you in turn, maybe starting with Anne and then running down the, running down the line, what is it that makes an adventurous curator today? And what would an adventurous curator today say that they wouldn't have said 10 years ago? Yeah, you start. <laughs> <laughs> you could say a little bit and then just pass it on and it could come back. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, I think maybe for me it, there's two sides to it. One is a desire to work with artists who I feel have been under-recognized in some way, whether that's over a, a, a long career or, um, or more emerging artists who wouldn't be under-recognized, of course, but just trying to think institutionally about what have been the gaps historically and in terms of certain groups that perhaps have been more marginalized or ignored. And I'm, I'm you know, very committed to uh, showing those artists. So for me, I suppose it's adventurous. I think it's more um, really fundamental to the field and, and how it should be working going forward. So I don't particularly think of myself as adventurous for doing that, but I recognize it's still an ongoing kind of um, initiative that needs to be embraced by more institutions. And then I think um, maybe the way that that question might have not been addressed a decade ago, or again, it's very much from my own way of thinking, but I think for me there's also a kind of adventurousness, not, a, not really a word I use, <laughs> but for this it's context. Been, it's, it's been, it's <laughs> been implied, thrust on us, yeah. yeah. Um, is to actually take nothing for granted. And so what I mean by that is that I think we inherit certain exhibition methodologies that seem to be kind of locked down. So if you're doing a monographic show, it kind of looks like this. Or if you're doing a, a, a group thematic show, this is how you go about it. Or you know, if you're doing a biennial, this is kind of the structure that is in place. And what I like to do is think about the problematics of each of those methodologies when I go into, you know, into one of them and to ask myself what I feel has worked well in the past and what doesn't work well and to kind of rethink those things. So as I was saying a little bit earlier about the Take It or Leave It show, I mean that was a historical show that ostensibly presented a kind of genre um, or way of working for a, a generation of artists, but we pushed against that a lot by not making it strictly generational, by showing recent work by artists who tended to be associated um, more with a, an earlier time period, and really asking ourselves a lot of questions about what does this even mean, this historical kind of show. Mm -hmm. and, um, and for me, certain choices that we made about that show was in an effort to keep the work very much alive in the present and to acknowledge the way that artists um, con you know, are continuing to make commitments to certain kinds of work. In this case, what we really believe um, is a critical kind of approach to their art making. And so trying to make that feel really relevant in the present, even when you're looking at it an exhibition that has some roots in a particular period, if that mm. makes sense. Yeah, and that would be interesting, Gary, in relation to your focus on 1993. Mm -hmm. 
for example. I'm now breaking the sequence, of course. I should actually, I should now turn to, we can talk, we can pick that up later. But also this, but also in relation to a conversation we had last night and the situation here and what I was touching on before, the question of focusing on the local in, in response to recent political events, that's also yeah. something perhaps you would talk about now that you wouldn't have talked about in 2007. That's right, yeah. Mm. Rosie. Yeah, I'm still kind of chewing this question over, I guess. And I think I would actually be really curious to know what Alice and Dea think of as adventurous <laughs> curators. Sorry, that's not supposed to be a cop-out. That's supposed to be, you know, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I found it a great compliment to be invited as an adventurous curator. Um, and I think I would like to reflect what Anne was saying about um, just thinking about how we can take from the material that we're dealing with appropriate ways to present it in a way that is always challenging the form, exactly. And I think, um, you know, when you asked the question, I was thinking, ah, so what is an unadventurous curator? <laughs> 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 Which is, for me, a sort of, I don't know if that's a horrifying prospect or not. I'm not sure. Um, there, is a, there is definitely a fashion for adventurous curators looking at hi art history now. I mean, you see it very yeah. strongly in Documenta yeah. and in Venice. In fact, there's always, there always seems to be some historical factor in the cu contemporary curatorial equation. Right. And, I mean, Anne was just touching on it and we talked about it in relation to the new museum. When you were at the Liverpool Biennial, you were mm. responsible for co-curating an exhibition of Whistler. Of, you know, right. of all things, in, you know, in yeah. the showcase of <laughs> new art yeah. from around the world, there was Maybe Whistler. That's adventurous. Yeah. yeah, that's right. When we, um, so, yeah, um, May Abu al Dahab and I curated an exhibition about James McNeil Whistler, who everybody will probably know had a mother and painted, you know, that's the story that we know about him. Um, <laughs> and when we a, a, a normal guy. Yeah. <laughs> exactly, a normal guy. <laughs> um, and when we proposed that to the Blue Coat in Liverpool, which is where that exhibition took place, they thought we were joking. Um, so I guess that is, but you know, in many ways, it's actually very unadventurous to propose a Whistler exhibition because we know the, the story that we think we know about him. Um, but actually what it became was an exploration of him as um, an artist, you know, a contemporary artist in the way that we understand the term today. So somebody who was thinking about um, an ex the exhibition as a total environment. There was one exhibition in which he asked the gallery attendants to wear <coughs> outfits that matched the scheme um, of the wall colours, so they had to wear yellow socks and kind of yellow and white trimmings on their clothing. So, um, but I guess, you know, he's also the adventurous one. It was our job to adventurously represent an adventurous and ad another adventurer. So, <laughs> yes, yeah, <laughs> we, yeah. you know, he made our job easy for us in a sense, and we decided to, um, you know, th the text on the walls we took from quotes that he'd from his life, from his writing and his letters and his, um, his correspondence. So, you know, to use his voice and to kind of foreground his voice became really important to us because he, yeah, exactly, he was, he was an adventurer. He was, he was who that figure was. So, um, yeah, I mean, I was also just saying to Anne, strangely, when this invocation came through, I remembered that um, an artist Mark Ariel Waller, perhaps some of you know him, once introduced me not as a curator but as an adventurer many years ago and it was just felt like a like wow okay great yeah. <laughs> well we can sort of dwell oh, we can nice. you know yeah. we can sort of continue to sort of dwell on that sort of come back to it. Yeah. Uh, I still don't know what it means I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say I still don't know what it means. Well to, I mean the idea of breaking new ground being on the edge of the conversation not doing things the way that they're conventionally done. Daniel, the, uh, we talked about this and it, you know, a really impressive interview between uh, Daniel and Gavin Brown in Spike magazine uh, not so long ago and you were focusing then on the art market, particularly in New York and what Gavin Brown was having to deal with and the idea of being adventurous in, in the commercial world is 
it's, you know, something that raises all kinds of questions. Arguably, the, the art market's becoming increasingly conservative, and that's certainly the, the kind of thread that was drawn through that conversation. You're not in that world, and arguably you're pulling s sort of away or diverging from what could be perceived as an increasing conservatism in the art market. And I think maybe, you know, the, the, the answer might be a simple one and a complicated and it's simple to say but hard to maybe hard to do. I think the fact that the reason why we're all drawn or at least the four of us and you certainly too to art is art ultimately I mean it's for, for me it's the all it's a, it's a great adventure. What, what artists propose uh, often time I don't understand it but I feel attracted to it because it offers me whole new worlds. So basically then you want to keep that energy uh, in, in, your sh in the shows and not tame them down into some compromise and <coughs> conventional exhibition but you want to have this incredible energy alive so you, that's maybe also a very European traditional point of view but I think it's, a, it's actually more than that, so a, a, an attitude you want, in order to, to keep that uh, alive you think yourself have to be adventurous as well, if the artist takes that incredible risk, you should go with the artist and then um, that uh, ask of you uh, to be adventurous and then there is in my case a very egoistic reason to be adventurous, it's just I don't want to get bored, <laughs> <laughs> it's just I throw problems at me so I don't fall asleep mm. because otherwise <laughs> There's something, something too that you said that was very strong was that, uh, that the museum or the gallery provides you with spatial experience. No, no, nobody here talked about being adventurous in the digital virtual realm and that was a significant thing because it is something that one would be touching on now that well, maybe 10 years, maybe 15 years ago. We, you know, I mean, we're, our heads are so full of it and our everyday experience is so, uh, a lot of it is so virtual. So, and then the, uh, the other interesting thing too is that you all talked about, in fact I think with the exception of Gary, you all talked about having fun and providing people with social spaces <laughs> and giving them fun. There was wor words like weird, amazing, fun, you know, we want people to have fun and you're kind of drawing them into these, to these um, institutions <laughs> where they will they will actually connect with, with each other, they'll connect with, with some sort of experience, not virtually, because I, you know, I don't think, to, unless I'm wrong, I don't think anybody talked about, you know, what was happening in the digital realm. You were all, you were all one way or another focusing on spatial experience. I mean, what, I mean, Daniel, what do you think that, what, what's that all about? Why? So, okay, the only way I can think to answer it. I think when television came up, a lot of artists thought that will be the new space. You had Gary Shum exploring things like this. But if you think back now, uh, how important is television for your art experience? It's probably not that important, right? So you could say the same of the new technology. I mean, then you could argue. Um, uh, what is this called? We are, virtual reality is, is the next thing. But still then, it's actually, it's just, you know, if you think about going to see a show, it's about you and the artwork, and the artwork in the space, looking at things, but it's also about the other people coming in, and the whole interaction, maybe starting to talk to somebody who asks you a question, or who falls on the floor, and you have to help. It's a whole thing, it's, it's more than just, the screen is all the time and it's so boring to look at this screen. So I think it, it, it's, uh, it's just a natural asset that seemed to us totally normal. We're only realizing now that it's, it is a huge asset and I think we just have to play it out more consciously. Mm. Uh, and and, and it's not the, I'm not against social media and all that stuff. I just think there are different ways of uh, uh, different things. Yeah. I think it also, uh, one of the jobs that we have as institutions is also to give people space for a different type of attention span. 
And some yeah. of the way you were talking, Gary, about some of those just much more in-depth exhibitions and the chance to sort of see and spend time with an artist in a different way, that feels like a, a way that I feel like I'm responding to this idea of what the digital <coughs> space well, the we old project, one, one work of art at a time. Yeah, yeah. It's slowing everything down. Yeah. Yeah, so Gary, what about you and adventure? How are you... How, how what's, the, what's the question? Not just to Gary, I didn't know it was... No, 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 it, was yeah. Yeah. it was definitely addressed to you. It was You to made you. an appropriate no, response. Oh, okay. Yeah, but oh, to Gary... Oh, sorry, <laughs> I got <laughs> it. Like <laughs> no, I mean, I th <laughs> of course, I think a lot about... Uh, a lot of the same, uh, you know, concerns and in decision-making processes we do at the museum and uh, especially in relationship to Anne because I think our institutions are probably a little bit closer programmatically um, in terms of dealing with upper underrepresented artists but I mean even to get back to what you're saying about fun I mean one like this theme that comes up in a lot of our discussions amongst our very small team is is to avoid um, in our choices of artists I mean the group shows are one thing but is to I mean, in New York, there's, it's very easy to fall into a kind of a critical, a critical consensus um, that, you know, amongst curators and, you know, especially also with the market. Um, so I think, you know, above all, we try with our shows, whether we're showing an underrepresented artist or an artist that some people may consider overrepresented, is to make sure we're not speaking to other curators as our primary audience. Um, so, you know, I mean, that may mean you know, doing, showing an artist like Jim Shaw, who's probably not known to the wider public, but, you know, deals with imagery and issues and ideas about art making that are, you know, I don't want to say accessible, but, you know, can resonate with people's own experience. Um, or, you know, when we do a show, you know, I didn't show that many in, um, images of solo shows, but, you know, when we do a show of an artist like Carson Holler or Pipilati Wrist, mm. you know, those are shows when you bring them up amongst certain other colleagues. Um, you know, you are somehow, you know, looked at with a sort of skeptical eye. And, you know, part of the reason we do those shows is, you know, not just because we know they're going to be spectacular and fun and, you know, entertaining for the audience, but, you know, the challenge for us is try to, is, is try to get at what made those artists kind of exciting and successful, you know, at the beginning of their careers when mm -hmm. they were working on a much smaller scale as opposed to, you know, what they are now. And, and you know, finding a more critical angle to look at those essentially very accessible and fun and, and entertaining practices. So, mm. you know, I think that's, um, I don't know if that's adventurous, um, but I think it's, you know, for us, it's like the, the sort of key to making sure that the museum stays connected um, and stays, you know, challenging to the audience, not, not through, you know, not through, um, you know, being obscure, but, you know, but being, um, you know, being thought provoking and challenging, no matter what kind of artists we're showing. You were, t you, you touched on politics, but not many others actually talked about politics. Politics didn't sort of come to the surface either, but it's not, I mean, I know that you are all, you know, politically motivated, but it was interesting that you didn't talk about them informing your program. Is there a reason for that? Or is it, you know, is it just something that you're assuming that we are reading between the lines? Our program, or our exhibitions, or well, our museum's program? Uh, your, well, your, I suppose it's difficult because you were all representing your institutions, but, but it would be nice to, to have your personal views on it. Um, I'm really interested in um, not artwork that tries to solve a political problem necessarily, or um, certainly not artwork that is somehow propagandistic. <laughs> um, but I really do believe that, that art, and by extension the museum, as a, as a social space and a public space, is a space in which we really can grapple with very difficult subjects. And I think that, you know, Obviously, since Trump was elected, this has been a discussion that I'm sure, I, I know we're having in depth and frequently, and I'm sure my, our other institutions in the US and, and, and Europe and elsewhere are, are certainly having, which is, you know, in the wake of this kind of devastating uh, election and what it means for our country, what, does, what becomes our role? Do we shift more toward 
uh, taking up more transparently and maybe more directly political subject matter. We're doing that a lot in our public programs mm -hmm. in a, could almost call it an aggressive way. <laughs> we're, we're actually doing like trainings for social protest and bringing in people to work with our public of whatever, whoever's interested in, in talking about, you know, how do you, how do you go out and protest? What happens if some, if you are getting arrested? You know, how do you respond to this? We're bringing in um, people who are actively involved in different organizations from Planned Parenthood to environmental groups to um, immigration lawyers to update our public on you know, really what's happening in the front lines of these battles and what they can actually do because we recognized that after the election, particularly when everyone kind of fell into an immediate depression, that people felt really helpless. And I'm curious about what the museum can do to try to you know, kind of initiate um, action, like mm -hmm. quite literally. Mm -hmm. And then in our programs, which of course are, are generally have to be planned far, far more in advance, we're also just finding opportunities here and there to um, add things in that feel really timely. So for example, for our lobby wall, we, we ended up postponing a planned lobby wall and inviting Andrea Bowers to come in and do a project that was all about um, water rights and um, the Dakota Pipeline protests and, and the relationship between the Dakota Pipeline and, and large banks in the US and abroad. And so it was this very, you know, almost polemical kind of installation that was very directly about this particular issue. And we just felt that we wanted to make space for something like that in the, again, in the wake of the election. But for my own practice, I, I think that I'm, you know, I'm drawn to artists who are really grappling with, um, you know, serious subject matter. It could be related to any number of things. Mm -hmm. But I think as much as, but I'm also interested in how they manifest those ideas through, an object. I mean, I love objects. I, 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 I'm not interested, actually, in the digital platform, really, at all. Mm. Um, I, I want, I'm interested in how people interface with an object in a space. And as Daniel pointed out, there's really nothing to compare to that. That is, I think, the most kind of immediate and personal relationship you can have. And so how do you, you know, how do you kind of balance those things? And of course, the best artists are the ones that, that do both mm. in a very meaningful way. But help us kind of, you know, make a path maybe forward, in moments when we feel really um, it's vulnerable. It's really very interesting that you're talking about this um, kind of public program that's equipping your audiences, your visitors, with um, you know, with, you know, with various predicaments that they may confront. And there is, I mean, when when Rosie, you talked about the village hall and that sort of beautiful modernist building mm -hmm. being uh, the village hall. It then kind of reminded me of what uh, Daniel had talked about, you know, there's an exhibition about bodybuilding. You could imagine on the village, the village hall, there's, you know, there's a, a night of bodybuilding. There's a night of, you know, <laughs> mindfulness and dream therapy. There's a, you know, there's a playground at the back. You know, all of these things are sort of being attached or they are being integrated with what might have not 10 years ago, but say 30 years ago, have been much more purist in terms of thinking about an artistic program. You know, all of a sudden, you know, we have Rurkrit making, uh, you know, there's entire dinners on a Thursday night, there's bodybuilding on a Friday night, there's, there are you know, playgrounds available on a Saturday, you know, equip yourself for the anti-Trump march on the Monday night. I mean, all, you know, art galleries are doing s so much more than giving you a painting show. I think for us, it's also uh, fascinating, or for, for me, for the Delaware Pavilion, there's politics in the building because it was built by, or the architects were, um, Eric Mendelssohn, who was um, a refugee from Nazi Germany, and Serge Shermayev, who is an um, emigre from Russia. So it's there, it's really there, embedded in the structure. And I think one of the things that I'm really interested in, as I'm sure you all figured out, is, okay, in a, in a state at the moment that we are in the world where kind of borders are on lockdown right now, and this question about borders is really um, permeating so many political conversations at the moment, how can we just remind ourselves that this extraordinary building from 1935 that a lot of people refer to as um, that now refer to or 
is in their imagination in a very kind of a sort of nostalgic way. How can we remind ourselves of the fact that actually um, the conditions for its production were incredibly complex and um, relied on openness and relied on, you know, uh, in the UK kind of welcoming people in who were um, escaping from something horrific. And, you know, where on the, I think all the time when I'm sitting in the cafe having a meeting, looking out, you know, we're looking towards Europe as well, mainland Europe, as we can say, hopefully. For <laughs> the <laughs> continent. The continent, I know exactly, yeah. yeah. That, and this idea of kind of being outward looking and drawing attention back to those histories is a really important project for me. But the other thing I think is that, um, you know, we have an amazing um, learning and participation team at, at the Delaware Pavilion, Ashley McCormack, um, who's my colleague there. And she's dealing with, um, you know, I was sitting with her and some colleagues, uh, other sort of art educators and artist educators who were asking the question, how do we create a programme for schools where, um, you know, art and education is being kind of teased out of sort of stripped or kind of wrenched out of the curriculum um, as the years go by. And the state schools um, often run out of paper by the end of the term. Like, that's a real thing, that there are some schools that just don't have paper. And how can we <coughs> work better to give teachers and the people who are running those institutions um, the opportunity to have art and artists in mm. their lives? Because art is something, like the Delaware Hulian, in my imagination anyway, is something that can help us look at the world and think about new futures and new possibilities and new ways of living and being. And um, yeah, I think that's all of this stuff is incredibly important to me and, and a huge motivator for what it is that I do and something that I want to do as much as possible. Gary, the idea of the Village Hall, I, I know with the new museum there are these meetings occasionally where you kind of draw people in for a kind of summit on, on issues that I could I imagine, well you talked about town planning but also touching on ecology I'm sure and and uh, you know other things that concern us in our everyday lives. I mean, could I mean, is it is it stretched too far to call the new museum a, a village hall? Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think um, I mean it's something we grapple with, you know, constantly. Um, is the fact that we used to be a small institution and part of a small community, and the fact that we're now a large institution and we consider ourselves, you know, an international institution that, you know, is exploring and participating in a larger um, art and political world. Um, but, you know, I think a lot of this programming, you know, it does often happen outside of the exhibitions program. It does happen through a program like Idea City or through um, what, um, you know, my colleague Johanna does um, with her mm -hmm. public programs, but also her exhibitions. Um, she does projects with artists um, like Simone Lee and Paul Ramirez Jonas are the two that come to mind most recently, um, you know, whose mm -hmm. work, you know, is about political engagement, but also about, you know, um, changing the experience and the interaction and the kind of dialogue that can exist between artists and viewers. So, you know, it happens in lots of different ways. And I think, you know, because our audience is not, is no longer a single neighborhood with a single demographic, um, our audience is now the whole city and, you know, a large tourist audience in the whole world. We try to create different scales to those discussions. So, you know, um, whether that's you know work that's more obliquely dealing with politics like Chairman Raymond or you know when we work with somebody like Pavel Altomer that's somebody from you know abroad who's coming into town and whose work is essentially about you know building relationships and communities in places that are you know not from where he's from mm -hmm. you know those kind of shows um, I think push us in the exhibitions program and also I think the programs that happen outside of our exhibitions program push me to think more strongly about how we can bring that into the exhibitions program. So, you know, right now I'm working on the Triennial and, you know, that uh, the challenge of a show like the Triennial is, is, you know, trying to come up with um, a methodology for dealing with artists um, of the same generation who are emerging from very different social and political contexts um, and you know, thinking about what those shared conditions might be. I mean, the last triennial dealt very strongly with the digital and that experience of growing up in, the, in a digital culture, how that affects you, you know, um, your, your identity and your kind of engagement with objects. But you know, no, obviously 
I'm very much thinking about you know our political situ situation in the United States and what kind of you know experiences experiences the artists I'm visiting in Latin America or Asia or you know soon Indian Africa like you know how can those experiences either speak to each other or what you know you know what what value is there in bringing those back to mm -hmm. our local audience. Um, the context where we, where we are now is such a, a different one and, uh, and we feel like a, a world away. But it is interesting in how Hauser and Wirth in Bruton could also be seen to be functioning like a, a village hall. I know that during your workshop that you, you, you met local farmers, you met people who were growing things, you met cheese makers and you know, possibly wine makers and certainly you know, the local publican with the pool table. I know, you know, that that you're very concerned to to be not just the um, and I address this to the uh, representatives and those working with uh, Hauser and Worth that you're concerned not to be seen to be this sort of weird, uh, disconnected, insulated art bubble, but very much sort of part of the the local e economy, part of the local conversation. And before we open up the conversation and, and actually invite those who are working with Hauser and Worth to join in on this, could you talk about your experiences here and, and actually, Rosie, in relation to this idea of being a village hall, I mean, ha I mean what is happening with Hauser and Worth here in Bruton? <laughs> is it, and is this an exciting new model? You know, given, in, I mean, this didn't exist 10 years ago. And in fact, I don't think anybody was imagining that anything quite like this would it have existed 10 years. How did it happen? It happened because we have a very buoyant art market. It happened because we're thinking differently about art, wanting to connect it up. Re we're being a lot more relational now. What do you think? I think one of the things that we've all remarked on is how extraordinary it is that Ivan and Manuela seem to have found all the right, exactly the right people for exactly the right thing. And somehow there's been, I mean, it's, it's kind of hard to know how it's happened. But I think, you know, one of the things that we were talking about was um, the fact that this type of engagement um, takes a long time. You can't expect just to kind of parachute this, you know, I come from a biennial, I know how it is that you can't expect just to parachute in and just suddenly you arrive and it all comes. I mean, you guys did a lot of work um, in the area before opening the site here to meet people, to find out who was around, to think of who the specialisms, what the specialisms are and what is possible because of who is here. And I think that conversation and that dialogue is seems really vital and it seems mm. to have really happened here and I think a lot of these kinds of things are really about the people and the dynamics and the relationships between people and what can be produced out of that. Daniel you said else. you were interested in in learning the you know what was it that made it successful mm. here you know five day, days later did you was the secret of its success revealed to you? <laughs> I think it's a it's a series of um, components. It's um, it's the fact that uh, you can come to a place where you have good food, a nice garden, an art gallery. I think there's also a certain sexiness of visit the rich, the successful, somebody who made it and who is redistributing part of their success back into the community. I think that has an enormous erotic attraction. Um, and, and then there's the landscape, and there's quality. Um, you know, there is a high standard of quality here that I must say I enjoy on all levels. <laughs> uh, and that's, uh, that, that, that makes actually your visit worthwhile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because you could also think, you know, there are other wealthy people doing things, but you don't want to go see it, it's too. <laughs> it's just terrible to see, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, th I think I think there's all these different um, uh, elements uh, elements to it that makes that makes it successful, and I think there's a genuine generosity involved here that um, um, you you somehow you sense it without can't really pinpoint 
it, but I think it, uh, there is a there is a generosity that I think is not cynical, that I think it is uh, genuine. So that's, um, we compared it with the Bayer Foundation Basel and it had a similar moment. You know, uh, Ernst Bayer was a, was, it was a very successful and interesting and passionate and um, art dealer and he had an extremely good eye, that's what people would say. We could also say that basically in the 90s he goes down into the storage and he says, oh, oh my God, I've got a collection here. You know, all of a sudden you think you've got a storage. Now, for, for 20, 30 years you think you have a storage and one day you open the door and it, you say, well, actually it's a collection. Yeah. And I think that's maybe true or not, but then he pulled it out and he, he wanted to build this um, museum. <coughs> As a similar situation. It's really beautiful architecture, and I think it's the case here. It has this garden with the pond, uh, and it has an amazing uh, collection. So he shared this very generously with the the public, and it was uh, and everybody is still enthusiastic about it. Mm. And it's of course very poignant, pertinent, timely, given what Rosie was referring to for us working uh, in this country in the not-for-profit public sector. I mean, we're feeling the squeeze, you know, the austerity, the, the, um, the, you know, definitely the funding cuts in, as far as the local authorities are concerned, I mean, it's, it's swinging and, and devastating and it makes a huge difference to, well, uh, Stephen Stoddy was here earlier, may still be here, what's happening in Walsall, for example, um, same story in Birmingham, I mean, extraordinary what's happened in Newcastle and Bristol recently. Not to go on about it, but you know, isn't it, isn't, isn't it great that this is thriving, uh, you know, on this side while, um, you know, there's a sadder story on the other side. Mm -hmm. And on that note, uh, can we open it up? To, should, can, do you mind if we open it up to the floor now? I have oh, to please. arrive at some consensus here with my panelists, but I, should, we, should we do that? So there's a microphone, Dea has a microphone, and if anybody would like to jump in with the first question. All you have to do is put your hand up. I have other questions up my sleeve, so you don't, don't feel. Yes, over, over there, in the black. Hi, um, thank you very much for all your presentations. It's been really um, interesting and inspiring. Um, I guess adventurous, and adventure has a sense of uncertainty about it when I think about it, and I just wonder, I'd be really interested to hear from all of you about any challenges that you've faced bringing people with you on your adventures and how you go about um, bringing whether it's your own team staff or audiences or funders with you on your adventures well there were uh, yes we were talking in the new museum you know bringing people with you they didn't think you know, a look at the 19, at 1993 would be that interesting I mean I think you know part of the museum has found was founded by a curator who left another larger institution for total curatorial freedom so um and although you know there's a kind of a balance between a sort of non-hierarchical structure and a, you know very dominant personalities you know part of the reason that all of us go to the new museum is because there's you know we don't have to convince anybody about our programs i mean we battle it out amongst <laughs> ourselves but even our director doesn't you know has vetoed nothing as long as i've i mean almost nothing as long as i've been there um <laughs> You know, the public and funders, that's, you know, another story. I think, you know, we have a confidence in what we do at this point that where we can stomach a bad review or a, a complaint from the audience from time to time. But, um, you know, it's more we have to push ourselves and then hopefully in the long run people get on board. I mean, funding is a whole other mm. issue. It's a big, it's a good question. It's the kind of question that people ask in job interviews, isn't it? Like, you know, can you talk about a challenging moment and how you, you know, how you faced it and how you succeeded. Anne, have you had any challenging moments? <laughs> I mean, you're, you're yes, dealing with one right um, now. Dealing with one now, but I should say that, um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, it, it took me eight years to convince Jimmy Durham to do a show with me at the, at the Hammer. So, you know, when I met him, I wasn't even at the Hammer. So there's been a long kind of um, courting time period um, in which I, you know, I think what, what was so interesting about that whole period was that, I mean, I can be very stubborn 
which my mother will attest to. So I never really gave up. I just felt that I'm stubborn, but I'm patient, let's say. So it seemed like this was a conversation to have with an artist over time. And when and if he became ready, I wanted to make sure that you know, I would do the show mm. with him. B because I know that this show would happen at one point or another. And if he hadn't done it with me, probably someone would have done it after he passes away. Um, which, I, which, I, which he knows, and well, that was actually something we talked about. But I think, um, you know, that uncertainty about whether he would ever agree to do the show was, you know, this kind of interesting experience. I mean, at times it was really frustrating. At times I just was like, oh my God, I should leave this poor man alone. I mean, you must think I'm actually a little bit crazy, you know, um, kind of stalking him in the way that I did. And, but I also just believed so much that it is an exhibition that needed to happen. And I think, you know, whenever there are those moments that are difficult or challenging or feel, you know, somehow like off kilter, it's just, you just go back to the work, go back to the work, <coughs> go back to the work, and remind yourself of why you were committed to it in the first place. And I find a lot of energy in that, and I find a lot of, um, there's a sort of enthusiasm that I have for the artists that I work with that I think uh, will always kind of re-energize the process for me. And, you know, somebody asked me at one point, like, oh, wow, you've been thinking about Jimmy's work for so long. So, you know, eight years to convince him, and then we worked together for three years before the show went up in January and so you know I, I, I've been thinking about his work for many many years and somebody asked me if after the process of kind of doing the checklist and and looking at a career if you get kind of bored of the artist which I thought was so interesting because uh, you know for me it's absolutely not it, it only makes me want to know more you know I kind of keep working on mm. his work even though really I shouldn't be doing that um, so I think that it's very generative, ultimately, mm. to, to get through these, these things, these kind of tough moments. This moment that I'm in right now, I, I, I don't know how it's going to go. Um, I think it's very, I think it's wrapped up in a lot of different things, but as I said earlier, I think it's an important conversation that, you know, is, um, it's going to happen on many different platforms with many different voices, and, and in a way, my voice is important, but it's also, equally as important that many other people um, are heard on this particular subject. Yeah, it's going to have huge implications, yeah. isn't it, for whatever happens yeah. in the future. Okay, other questions? Here in the front. <laughs> hey. Hi, I wanted to come back to what you said about um, the border closing down. And um, I wondered what you all thought of um, you know, Brexit and Trump, you know, bringing in the borders, how you think that will influence um, the future of, like, art? Do you think we've come to, like, an mm. end of a golden age of internationalism? Do you think it will have an effect on the kind of shows and uh, on your work in the future? Do you see that having an effect? Actually, can I, uh, if Anne can answer that question just quickly, because yeah. uh, we did talk about this last night, and, you know, there was an idea of localism, in, to some extent as a kind of um, reaction yes. a, a, and a, a bringing people together in the face of adversity but counterbalancing it or making sure that you're then not going down a road of insular provincialism yeah. and I think if you could just make a couple of uh, remarks on that and yeah. then open it up to our, Europe, our European well actually you're Swiss yeah. we could be in the same <laughs> basket as you but some of the well, you, know, you what does it feel? You can tell us, Daniel, how it feels. <laughs> but add uh, quick, uh, quickly. Um, let's see. Well, I think just along the lines of some of the things I've already been saying, I'm I'm definitely recognizing in Los Angeles a, a desire to think locally, insofar as people feeling a need f to feel connected to their own community. So it's not a rejection of internationalism. It might be a rejection of nationalism. <laughs> I hope it is. Um, and also a lot of, um, I don't know, for better or for worse, a, a sort of pride in, in Los Angeles and California as, in a way, th this space that still feels sort of safe in some sense to explore ideas. And, and also, you know, people in LA feeling 
very strongly that that's where they want to be. And in being there and in making that decision, you know, to be there and to stay there, wanting to make sure that they feel a sense of community and, and really communities, of course, in the plural. And so I'm seeing a lot of in, in the art world in particular, a lot of efforts on the part of of artists and, and others to, to find those connections, a lot of collaboration and collective activities are happening, and a lot of um, interfacing with other kinds of cultural production, as I think we see here in Somerset, you know, an interest in how can art also relate to these other kind of quality of life um, activities that people are involved in. And, and I, it, it's really nice to feel that. It's nice to feel this sense of local, um, you know, attention and yet, I, d I think we have to always be very cognizant of that not becoming um, a kind of provincialism, as Jonathan said. I'll just give you, though, which is maybe a, another way to answer your question, um, one small example of, um, I had a, a Canadian art historian who was supposed to come and speak on a panel, and um, he, after Trump's election, he uh, declined to come. Mm -hmm. So there are some real repercussions of having Trump in office where we might suffer by people actually choosing not to come to the US. And I think, you know, of course, Adrian Piper has a huge show coming up at MoMA. It will travel to the Hammer. She won't come to the US. I mean, she's felt that way for a, a, probably about a decade now. But, um, but, you know, we might see some of these, not only people who aren't allowed in, but the people who just choose not to come. Mm. How, Daniel, how does it feel from, from your point of view <laughs> in Zurich? Well, you know, that question of the local is something I, I, I'm, um, it was also in my, I think when I applied, I said I'm interested in the local because I thought everybody, yeah, that whole thing about the globalization, and so I kind of didn't get it. But then I did this show, Speak Local, and, and doing this show, I had to um, <coughs> face that question. And I said, it's, because it's very dangerous territory, it's just next to provincialism, it's next to nationalism, it's also next to commerce, you know, that whole buy local is two steps from heavy economy. It's like the new fad, it's like the new global uh, brand, right, buy local. So, <coughs> and I actually now think, and then uh, I was thinking uh, about it and went through to, uh, we did a walk with friends and they asked me, so what's the next show? They're not out of the art world. And I started to talk and I think, and then I, I, all of a sudden I thought, oh, I, you know what, it, it's not about the local, it's actually about the sense of belonging that people are looking for. And it's, <clears throat> I think what globalization did, it unrooted people, but it didn't, it didn't give them tools back to forge a sense of belonging, yeah? Because money and market doesn't create any sense of belonging. So that's what the whole local, I think, is, uh, is standing for. It creates a, a sense of belonging for people yeah, actually moving out from London to Somerset. And then <coughs> they connect here with a type of culture they actually know from London. But it's not the same. So, you know, it's, it's a very complicated uh, but interesting uh, uh, a dynamic and it's not it's uh, it's not a bad one at all and so that's but initially I I came to think about that going to Bangladesh and seeing uh, I was invited to create a show with young artists for a kind of biennial and I saw all these young artists and they would all talk about their specific situation but they obviously they knew thanks to internet and education about the more or less global art world, but they're all very much interested in, in a very precise context. And there's no complex about doing this. They, none of them want to, they don't want to be kind of international, do international art. They, 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 they want, they use their art for local purposes, yet the language is, is an, I would say, a more international one. Mm -hmm. So I think there's something interesting going on there of a new generation who almost, you know, is, is like talking about figuration and abstraction, global, local. Uh, maybe it's not, uh, it's, it's, we should overcome even this mm -hmm. one. Yeah. Anybody else want to come in on that or uh, back to the floor? Yes, so microphone is over there. Thank you. Um, 
I'm very interested in the difference between the two members of the panel from the US and the level of political engagement that you are able to bring to the work that you do. And I may be missing something, but I don't see a similar level of political engagement in art institutions in this country. And I would just ask the question whether or not you think that that has anything to do with the way in which our arts organizations in this country are funded, as opposed to the way yours might be, and if in fact that puts some brakes on what we're doing, or whether it's to do with our national psyche. Rosie, what do you think? It's a really interesting question, actually. Um, and it reminded me of um, a conversation that I had with an American colleague um, a few years ago about him saying, he said, he's the director of an institution in the States, and he said that he wouldn't be able to tell his board that he voted for Obama. And yeah, which is which was really curious to me actually, because there is is and then it kind of raised. I didn't really resolve that question with him whether there's, you know, because a lot of um, you know how that political difference manifested itself. Whether that's a common political difference in institutions and whether um, because I don't feel that it has an effect on his program actually. So what that relationship was, I never really quite got to the bottom of that. But I think um, I think it's yeah it's an it's an interesting one. I feel that colleagues around the UK are politic are politically active actually, and I do see a lot of work that comes from that place and that's motivated by that place. Um, I think maybe. Um, I don't know if it feels like maybe there's more of an immediate urgency in the States right now. Um, <laughs> but I don't know if that's, I mean, things are, as I said before, I'm really contradicting myself now because there's an, there's an amazing urgency in terms of what's happening politically in terms of kind of, you know, I talked about education, but many other things as well. So I don't know, what do you think? I think there is quite a lot of political curating going on yeah, here. Yeah, I think so. Actually, and... Um, uh, you know, I sort of feel that we're doing it ourselves at Icon, actually. Yeah, yeah. And there are some things that I feel, feel that have been talked about so much. I mean, I'm the curator of the Iraqi Pavilion uh, in Venice and then sort of brought that back home to Birmingham, which was uh, uh, interesting. And then we did it in South London. So, I mean, that's, that's me. But I, and I don't think that I'm a particularly political curator, and there are others who are more overtly um, political. So... Uh, you know, I think America does it a different way. Perhaps yeah, it's a little bit more, maybe that's it. Um, uh, you know, s it's kind of probably more hard-hitting, and may there may be a bit of English understatement in you know what it is that we do. But I, you know, I think um, what struck me was the comments you made about education mm -hmm. and actually educating people to protest. And I'm just concerned that there doesn't seem to have been a lot of education in areas where we really could have done with it for the Brexit, the whole Brexit debate, and where I think we mm. still need it. And I'd like to see those sorts of... Yes. I mean, it was very interesting, actually, because we did, you know, we went with Wolfgang Tillmans at Icon. We had all the right. posters up. We sold all the T-shirts. We sold all, out all the T-shirts. And the Tater show again now in there, in there. Yeah, and that's, you know, and quite, you know, quite right too. And it was interesting yeah. being told by people, you know, you're a cultural organization, not-for-profit, should you <coughs> put, uh, pin your colors to the mast? Yeah. And we felt very strongly that we would. And, you know, when Ai Weiwei was imprisoned, we had a special sort of display, you know, f you know for, for him. So, I, you know, I, and I don't feel any pressure on me not to be like that. No, no, no. And also, I think there is a lot of amazing work that our colleagues are doing in terms of, I mean, again, looking back at histories and readdressing the balance. So there's that fantastic show that Nottingham Contemporary did um, recently about, uh, which shone a spotlight on the black arts movement in the 1980s, mm, mm. that then is coming to the South London Gallery. There's the show at Tate, um, Soul of a Nation, that opens uh, tomorrow night, that's looking at. Um, 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 African-American artist movement in the, in, in, um, the States. 
I think there's a, there is, maybe you're right, it's a sort of understatement, but I've, I feel like there's been, there's been a lot of work, and I think also a lot of our colleagues in um, education and learning departments are doing incredible work in schools in very kind of, in very urgent situations and trying to kind of plug a, a gap there. So I think it, I think it's happening. On the other hand, I'd hate to, to feel that we were obliged. Yeah. And I don't know whether you all feel the same. I mean, there's still space in our program for systematic minimalism, you know, or, yeah. or you know, something very formal, yeah. Absolutely. you know, yeah. monochromes, you know, like they're going out of fashion. But I think, I mean, almost to get to your point, though, I think both Anne and I are in a very privileged position to work in cities like New York and Los Angeles, where, you know, those... There is, there's no um, pressure on not having a program that deals with politics. And, you know, yes, we may have, I'm sure both, either, both of us may have a board member who voted for Trump, but there's not a single person who would, you know, like expect for a second that I didn't vote for Obama. Yeah. So, I mean, I think that's, you know, also the problem is, it's not even a problem, but, you know, we also are speaking to a local audience who does, you know, essentially, understand the language we're working with and probably shares a, a politics even if it's not that the methodologies are not always you know, on the same page I think it is harder for you know colleagues that we have who work in cities outside of New York and Los Angeles whether it's you know in the south or in the Midwest I mean and the role of education there becomes much more complicated and you know it's it is more of a risk to do that kind of programming um, mm -hmm. whether it's through funding or kind of backlash from the community yeah well, it's now uh, two minutes to and I'm, I know that we've got taxis coming at 4.15, so I think, room for, uh, Daya, one, for one more question? Yeah, but Stephen Snoddy, aforementioned, in the back row, <laughs> in a white shirt. So, uh, very briefly, when um, the local authority decided uh, nine months ago to cut our funding to zero, which we've now rescued, but at the same time as that happened, a local community group came to see me with uh, a tapestry project to document the, the 11 villages that make up Walsall. And the idea was to make a tapestry of each village. And then at the end of the project, there would be 11 tapestries. So it was led by local community. And Bearing in mind the political situation we were in, I spoke to my curatorial team and they were dead against us doing this community project because it wasn't proper art, right? And sometimes as a director, you have to put your hand up in the air and say, given the political situation we're in, I think it would be incredibly useful for us to work with this community group who ended up being probably 100 people 10 roughly working on each tapestry and we programmed it in in January of this year and it was on show for eight days at the New Art Gallery and we reckon we received an additional 1500 visitors who were probably had never or very rarely been in the New Art Gallery and my whole reason was to do it for get people into the gallery so my question is You've talked about your public program, you've talked about the great programs that you do in relationship with your exhibitions. How do you react to a community group that comes to you with an idea or a project? So they, that's an adventurous director <laughs> <laughs> asking you. So, so in other words, uh, that was in the context of where we were, we perhaps probably would not have done that project. And I, sorry, I should also say that I think that that has changed my um, thinking about the New York Gallery as we move into more uh, slightly certain funding future. But actually, I received huge amount of community support in uh, the funding of the gallery and what it means to the people of Walsall. And I actually am very, very proud of myself for having done that community project because that will reap benefits in the future. Mm. So it's actually changed me and, and I'm saying to my staff now, rather than wait for those community groups to come and see us, we now have to go out and seek those community groups, talk to them, 
they might have an idea which might be, I don't know, baking cakes or whatever it is. And I am now trying to encourage them, on top of the programme we do, which is going out anyway, is to bring in more community groups to the New York Gallery Walsall. Daniel, what do you think? Because it sounds a bit like up your well, street. I th you know, I think in the end of the day it's the same as for artists. Um, uh, it's, a cri uh, it's really a question, uh, uh, question of um, a matter of, criteria, of quality. Um, you know, it's, it's not because you're, you're, you're a community that it is good what you're doing or is interesting. There are loads of communities doing things that I find not interesting. Okay, sorry, I can I just... End, I just let me finish. Okay. Um, in the end, is if there comes a community, um, a project that I find interesting, it's totally fine. But I want to have quality. Our community is not enough for me. So, le le sorry, let me just say that the tapestries, when they came back, I swear to you, were as good as Grace and Perry. Honestly, they no, were fantastic. I, I have no doubts, yeah. I, I mean, that's something I would be interested in, for instance. I had people coming suggesting performances and all stuff, and we would do that. But I want to get the sense that it is something special. We did a project with Riekrit Tiruvannet called Demo Station, and he invited people, local groups, that could be uh, model railways, could be origami, chess players, magic tricks, uh, balloon sculptures. They just had to be really good. That's, that was his, you know, they just yeah. had to be really good at what That's they what do and give them space for, yeah. in your gallery. Yeah. Gary, what do you think? Would you respond to a local... East Village, Bow the Bowery. We sort of have the opposite problem, I would say, than, uh, than probably you do, Stephen, in that, you know, what, on the one hand, um, the community in the Lower East Side is not what it used to be. Um, it, you know, it's much more wealthy and much more, you know, I would say less coherent, you know, demographically in terms of ethnicity. Um, but also, you know, we, because we are a large institution, you know, it's a challenge for us to Ha get community, however you want to define it, to feel like the museum is a place that is also for them. Um, and, you know, I think part of that is because, because of the nature of the neighborhood, but also because there are lots of institutions in New York. Um, and also because it can be very, you know, foreboding and sometimes expensive. Um, so, you know, I v almost rare, like, never do we have community groups reach out to us, but through programming, often driven by artists, some public programming, but also driven by artists, you know, we do start to build those relationships and, you know, start a dialogue and hopefully, you know, that potential can happen. I mean, I think the best one we had was actually Pavel Altamer, um, you know, whose work lends itself to that, where, you know, I mean, in addition to making sculptures, he also collaborated with a group of um, men uh, living at the Bowery Mission, which is our neighbor two doors down, and it's the oldest homeless shelter in New York. Um, and it was a private um, invitation that was extended by him to the mission, by us and him to the mission, um, for men to work with him in a kind of arts, um, like a sculpture workshop um, and a film workshop. And they worked over the course of three months and they did an, eventually did an exhibition um, to the public in our ground floor space. Um, but also Pavel did a piece on the fourth floor of the museum called the Draftsman's Congress, which is essentially kind of a, a round space that we built out, white space built out on the, that took up the entire fourth floor. And any visitor to the gallery was invited to come and paint and draw on the walls. They were given art supplies or whatever. But also it was open to, you know, very specific invitations were made to all different kinds of community organizations within um, the neighborhood and also, you know, within the city at large. And, you know, that for many people, that was a lot. The first time, you know, we had a group from Chinatown of, you know, Chinese residents coming into the museum. They had, we offered them invitations in the past, and this was probably the first time they came on board. Um, and all these groups, you know, felt that this was, you know, a, a chance to, even for a time, you know, put a message within the con context of the museum, or that the fact that maybe that something in this museum, you know, was reaching out to them for a space to collaborate or to kind of, you know, talk about what it is that we do and what, how they can possibly relate to it. So, you know, that project actually is, continues to, I think, bear fruit in terms of like, mm. at least an openness to start having those discussions. And I think that's, you know, what we have to try to continue to achieve with what we do. Rosie, what about you, embroidery in your village hall? Uh, yeah, well, it's a good question. Um, I think we've, we've had a, um, one of the criticisms that the building had when it opened was that the architecture was extremely uh, forward-looking and, you know, but the programme that happened in it 
wasn't always so much. So looking through the archive, I saw um, um, one of the exhibitions, which I guess was temporary, was um, a cat tableau that people were invited to come and participate in this cat tableau, <laughs> but no living cats. Allowed. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I don't know what that really was, but to me that's like... <laughs> Illegal. <laughs> like a heap of dead cats, that's the only thing I could think of. But that's quality, you know. That's <laughs> So I think I feel the same way. I mean, I think that it's really important for us to open our doors to as many people as possible. And it's something that I, I think about a lot, actually, because, um, you know, there is a part of our building that it's still possible um, to hire. Um, and sort of how we tell the story of what those things that hire, are hired out, you know, all this kind of stuff. That's, that's, that's really complicated. But there must be opportunities where it is possible for people to come and present their cat tableau or whatever it is that <laughs> they, and, um, they want to do. An opportunity, you had, I, you had the, the difficult first word and I, here's a chance for you to have the, the, last word. the in this symposium, the last word. <laughs> uh, okay, on quilts. Um, <laughs> Actually, anything you like. I mean, I just, I think that we're all always thinking about how to reach out to our communities and we're, we do it in a number of ways. And I think through, it's not very often that we would have a group come to us in that very direct way um, that Stephen just described of, you know, can you please show these, these objects? But um, certainly through our public program, we, we reach out to many different people and bring them in for, for different activities. And, um, and I think that, I think we're perceived in the ecology of institutions in Los Angeles to be very open and to be very attentive to the idea of a local audience, more so than other institutions. We know from a study that was done of museums in Los Angeles that we have the highest local audience percentage-wise, less tourists, more locals, and therefore we also have the highest rate of any museum in the city, actually, of return visitors. Mm. So I think that we just, in a way, we almost take that for granted. Um, I don't mean in a bad way, but we just, we never think like, are local people coming to our museum? We know that they are, and we're, we're aware of them, and we think about them and, and try to respond to them in some way. But I think, to answer the question, I suppose it, it is just a matter of if something's, if something's compelling, then you'll want to partner with people and do something, and if, if not, you won't. Mm. So. And I'm sure the same applies to Hauser and Worth. <laughs> and just uh, on, oh sorry, were you going to... Well, no, if, yes, do add something, then I'm going to wind everything up with a, with a fulsome thanks. <laughs> I was going to do the same, so why really? don't you go first, and then oh, I'll thank okay. you. <laughs> oh, Daya, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, oh, and all those at Hauser and Worth, actually, for, uh, for having us. Yeah. And, um, and thanks enormously to our audience, who have been so intelligent in their responses to the conversation and the presentations. But above all, were you going to say this? Shall I do it? Okay. Uh, thanks to Gary, Daniel, Rosie, and Anne. Please join me in an expression of gratitude. On that theme of openness, sorry, thank you so much for how open you guys have been this week, the generosity of knowledge that you've shared and everything. It's been absolutely a privilege and pleasure. So thank you. And thank you, Jonathan, Anne, Rosie, Daniel, and Gary.